I've been asked to um, say a little bit about the research I've been conducting, and you'd have heard from Yvonne and Phil in terms of the, the connectivity with the wider, broader, longer term um, feature. So what I don't want you to do is to think of this as an isolation piece of work. Um, it's actually integrated and connected to a wider and longer term vision. You should have a copy, a summary copy in your in your, in your bag. And um, I just did a, a printed copy of the final film for myself um, so that um, I get a sense of how it feels. And those who know me know I like papers. And so I'm not much into the gizmo, although I read it, but I actually like the feel of paper. So if you're like me, you like the feel of paper, you're in good company. A place to call home. I'm going to wander around, so I'm going to try and, and, and avoid um, obscuring and also getting in the way. A place to call home, Mark II, 2.0, didn't just begin with the completion of the first place to call home, 2015. Yvonne alluded to 2010, the big question that she wrote, and it is important that we put this in a time frame rather than see it just happen. A lot of things have been happening since 2020 on the back of the George Floyd murder and Black Lives Matter. And all of a sudden, the world has awakened to atrocities, inequities, injustices. It's almost as if we'd been sleeping for hundreds of years and suddenly in 2020, we have just awakened, and it's almost like, forgiven this phrase, we have been on the road to Damascus. And suddenly, ha! So we are on this journey and have been on this journey. So 2015, for those who've read it, and if you haven't read it, could go back onto the Ubele website, um, really started to open up the question around community assets owned by the African diaspora communities that had been secured and acquired as a result of, um, I wouldn't say riots, but concerns, deep-seated concerns since 1948. And let's get it into perspective. Since Windrush, it has been an ongoing battle of recognition and understanding and evaluation. And in the 70s and 80s, it got into a position, or we got into a position, where it was enough is enough for a lot of communities. Out of which, a number of things uh, arose. 2020, we had COVID. But Yvonne had already asked me to consider a place to call home prior to COVID. It's important that this was not a reaction to Black Lives Matter. And it is important to say that because that journey we've been on since 2010 had meant that we were looking ahead. Yvonne alluded to what's on the horizon. Five to 10 years is probably a short term. And it is important to take that into consideration. So a place to call home asks the question, what is the benefits and the value of owning cultural and community assets? 2015 asks the question, where are we and what's happened? In our approach, this looks like a spidergram. So I'm, just going, I'm not going to go through all of it. It's in the doc, not this document, it's in the, the, the full document that you get. There's a QR code at the front that you could give access to. But in broad terms, on our sample size, when we looked at our database in terms of Ubele, we had around 750 people, uh, organizations, not people, organizations that we'd identified over the years. When we culled it and looked at it and all the rest of it and sent out, we had a lot of bounce back and whatever. But effectively, we had identified 640 in the end when we stripped away some of the uh, irrelevant organizations that we've been in contact with. Example, the BBC, the National Lottery. They're on our database, but they weren't relevant to the project. So we stripped those out. We conducted a survey with those 640. We also had a parallel program going on with the GLA called Barriers. 
and some of you have been involved on both sides. We also had a series of focus groups, some are directly linked to specific projects where people are interested, but also we had the strategic alliance meetings where we actually tested and trialed some of the things that was coming out. Importantly, those of us who was in, in Lisbon had a session where we actually looked and explored uh, the model that we're going to come on to um, later on. We had a series of one-to-ones and there, ultimately we had 55 organizations that responded to the online survey and um, we had about 90 organizations, or 90 people that were involved, 96 involved in a series of one-to-one -one focus group. Some of the terminologies we're using in the, in the report is worth sort of men commenting on. And I'm just going to read this out because this is, the, this is a, f a starting point for Ubele. And it's important to recognize that the diversity of individual identities and lived experiences are, um, and understanding that the use of the short form BAME. And during the pandemic, it became an area of concern and an area of debate still. But during that period, it became heightened in terms of references to BAME. Black, Asian, and minority ethnic group is an imperfect term. However, for within Ubele, we use the language black and racially minoritized, and it is important because you will be hearing the phrase black and racially minoritized, and it is important to hold on to that. We also use as part of our criteria organizations that at least 51% or more of their directors or trustees and also senior managers within the organization as our definition of black-led, black and racially minoritized-led organizations. When we looked at the question of culture and community assets, a lot of variations on that. But for me and for the work we do, it seemed to make sense to conjoin cultural and community assets as a term, because I think it refers to the objects, the traditions, and the practices that assist in what I would call the continued social historical development of the communities. You cannot divorce one from the other. And so it makes sense for us to be talking about cultural and community assets. And so when you hear us make reference to that, it's an umbrella term that captures and recognizes that. In broad terms, I mentioned the 64, 640. 50% of the sample size were based outside London. So we had a 50-50 split in and outside London, which is quite interesting because prior to this, two, um, 2015 report was virtually, not all, virtually London based of London focus. And that's a good reason for that. It's because the connection at the outset of Ubele was based in London. And it's a natural um, gravitation and link. So there's nothing, but it shows the movement from 2015 in terms of geographical reach. 50-50 is actually very good. 45% of respondents to the survey were registered charities. Another 40, so about 90% overall. 100% were in the broad thing of charitable organizations, incorporated and unincorporated, social enterprise, CICs, as well as charities. So we had taken out all the for-profit organizations and made sure that we were able to take them out of the, the equation. 10% of respondents to the survey indicated owning their own assets. Only 10% of the 55 respondents at organization had own freehold Hold on to that, 10%. 62% were um, renting um, under five years and 18 were leasing for up to 10 years. So if you take the 10% of those 55 that owned, it meant 90% did not own assets, whether they're renting, leasing, or just dosing. Therein lies an interesting notion of journey and travel. How you prepare for that. Organizations were community assets were, ch were children and young people. The overwhelming use beneficiaries of those programs, those organizations work, were children and young people. Not exclusively, but overwhelmingly. And 40 years of responding organizations who survey employed both full-time and part-time. Just under 50% had resources to employ staff to help create the capacity within the organization. So this is an overarching picture of those organizations that since 2015 that had been closed since um, 2015. 
of, of the numbers. And in, you see the regional split, the 50% London, and where we're getting respondents from, the Northwest, Northeast, Yorkshire, the Humber, East. So there's a fair spread across the region. We could still do more. Don't get me wrong. This is a starting point, and it's very helpful. So, some, so that's a quick canter through the backdrop. And some of the key findings, very little had changed since 2015 in terms of ownership, in terms of organizations opening, closing, extending capacity development. Since the original um, report, at the time, two or three, there were about three or four that we knew were on the cusp of closing, and they closed. All those that had remained on the system still oscillate and other in terms of challenges with the local authority to extend their lease or in long-term conversation. Long-term conversation. I know of one organization that's been in conversation for nearly 15 years. And every year it's a renewal on and off. The challenges that organizations were expressing fell into either external or internal factors. I'll say a little bit about that in a second. And not all the organizations necessarily wanted to secure a freehold um, property, but they wanted a sustainable unit, either lease over 15 years or so, to give them the capacity or, or longer. A lot of them were also having problems with landlords, private um, landlord as well as council landlord, who chose at the whim, in their words, to say to them, it's time for you to go. Organizational state of readiness for investment, and this includes grant giving, was seen as a stumbling block, i.e. organizations weren't ready. They weren't clear what they wanted to do, how they wanted to do, and how they would get to that position. So, a quick canter through some of the challenges. Most of these are, are in the, the full report in particular, but the, the internal factors, and the, when I looked at this and I thought, ah, it can't be internal or external. There's got to be some overlap at some point. And part of that overlap found was this question of discriminatory discrimination and or discriminatory practices that affected both the internal configurations as well as the, the external practices. So that gives us a really good point in terms of a space to be explored, to be challenged. But some of the internal factors relate to the organizations themselves and how they manage or see the world, especially to the governance and leadership of their organization. And this is not necessarily saying the board is a bad board. It's saying, what's your vision? It's looking at whether or not governance is operational. And in a lot of the organization, due to their size, you had your strategic board management also operationalizing and delivering work. So you're, you're being pulled all over the place and the longer term journey is, is getting left behind. So how do you free yourself up is the challenge. And how you free yourself up as a board and as a leader or a leadership framework to be able to do that longer term um, engagement. And therein lies some of the challenge. Linked to that is the external fact. To challenge the external fact, you need that capacity. And so you could react to the external factors like regeneration, opportunities, a special local authority. And some organizations were telling me they didn't have the time to engage in consultation processes. Why should I bother? No, I do not. And that was what people were telling me. Oh, you understand, Carl. Yeah, no. A waste of my time. Right? And you hear it up and down the country. People are telling you, it makes no difference if I get engaged or not. They're just going to do what they want to do. The other side is that get involved and push that door open. And so you had people on either side of the, of the coin saying, we can do this because we've found the, the capacity. We've got people there and we've made our voices heard. And therein lies the difference. Physical asset ownership. I mentioned already the question about um, tenure and the fact that some organizations were struggling to get answers from the local authority. 
about whether or not they have their asset. It remains a major issue, a major problem. Land, especially in uh, areas I suspect like Manchester, but definitely in, in, in London, it's expensive. Finding free spaces that you could actually argue for is at a premium. You are vying with housing stock development, commercial unit development, versus community asset requirements. Financial resource and investment. Organizations were struggling to get grant aid over a long term. One of the things that people commented on was the short-term emergency funding that the COVID emergency opportunity gave. And when I did a calculation and an analysis of 30 organizations, just randomly from the list, 72% uplift between 2020 and 2022 across the board from where they were in 2018. So it, were, it helped the emergency. The problem then came when the emergency fell by the wayside. So you had a momentary blip, but it fell down again. So where were the organizations in the downturn in terms of their preparedness and their readiness? And so organizations were saying to me, now that we, 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 we went through the high, now we're now floundering now because the funders have sort of, I will not say they pull up the drawbridge, but I mean, they're, they're, they're asking us for things that a year or so we were getting because they're targeting our work and all the other bits and pieces, but now they've put other measures in place. So are we ready for changes like that? And where are they coming from? New opportunities and initiatives. There is a question about going back to the notion of connectedness and engagement, which I, I like because the more and more I looked into this and the more and more I was listening to people, there was a missing piece. And the missing piece for me was about the extent to which the organizations, going back to 100% charitable organizations, are invested in the communities of interest that they're working with but they were failing to demonstrate their connectedness and engagement with those, with those said same communities. I'll say a little bit about that in, in a second. And so therein lies a challenge, which is an internal question, because it's how you, the organization, interface with your, uh, with your beneficiaries. And if you're failing to do that, you can't expect the external factors to take that into account. So that's an internal challenge to us in terms of how we're doing that. And again, the governance and regional capability within the management um, structure and the organization, your configuration, is also another question. So for me, there are questions that are, are internally focused factors and externally focused factors. Some of the funding challenges that individuals um, alluded to. Lack of sustainable core funding. This notion of core funding, where you have short-term 12-month funding from either national lottery, dare I say, a lot of people say, that's all we have um, access to, let's go for it or you have a two-year funding from another funding organization, but largely local authorities. And local authorities, by and large, tend to do a 12-month rolling um, funding, and they tend to do small funding pots and or have historical funding formula. And if you're in with the local councillors, you're more likely to have that continuation. That's just a, a slight by the side. Constantly fundraising to cover core costs. Successful in raising funding for a redevelopment, but finding it difficult in managing the complex. So yes, you've secured the funding, but managing it is another issue. The money comes in, the funding comes in, we know what the work needs to be done, but the reality dawns, we don't have the capacity. And so that's a challenge. We are forecasting, I'm not sure what that white blob is here for, but anyway, we are forecasting that we will use up our minimum financial reserves by the end of 2023. The question around financial resources and how you manage your budget, cash flow, and this thing about financial resources is a question that keeps coming up. We don't know how to do this, we don't have the resources, we don't have the capacity, we don't know how. And those who do, we haven't lent on them. Something that was coming through is almost not a narrow perspective, but there was a, a failure later on. We, we talked about um, different options and looked at the question of sharing um, resources to maximize on what there is. And, and what was coming through was that organization had this fear of being taken over by another organization. So there, there's a reluctance to share and engage with others 
in order to learn. So core cost, short-term emergency funding helpful, but in the long term, it wasn't um, working, and in-kind funding support. There were organizations that were securing in-kind support, either as part of a leveling up application or part of some um, partnership, especially organizations that had a resource or a facility like this, and say, if we come in with you, can you give us um, access to maybe one evening a week, two evening a week, whatever case happened to be. And it's looking at our organizations can use existing resources and work hand in glove with those individuals to maximize your opportunity. And if you're a new and, and, and emerging organization, it makes sense because you don't have the capacity in your own right. But you can learn and build with others until you get your, uh, onto your feet. One of the questions we ask about where organizations um, secure their, um, their, their funding, especially grant. And you can see grants and trusts and foundations into their overarching, but low down in terms of bank overdraft and low down in terms of fees charged. So overwhelmingly, it's grant aid that's propping up the vast majority of organizations that we, we have within our midst. And we can say this area, if we had the asset, we would be generating more income. Not disputed that, and that's one of the strongest benefit of why we'd want to do one of the benefit of owning community asset. But it is not the only way to generate income. And that is the, the other question. Is this the only way to generate income? If income is what we're, we're looking at. Indicate the funders that you had successfully generated income. This is since the ending of the emergency funding. There was a question about the emergency funding, but that's taking you. The, the full report, you'll have that. But just focusing on the question of who is funding what. And you see the national lottery, local authority. These are, are the areas or the routes that's resourcing local cultural and community organizations. And therein also lies both opportunities and challenges. So we had a look at the question of readiness. And so we're asking these key questions in terms of physical asset ownership, the regeneration, governance, and leisure. And that led us to think through the question of sustainability, independence, the question of security and resilience, community confidence, private, all these were seen as assets and benefits from. And in terms of what um, other unexplored options and reasons for why people wanted to have access is about reducing upfront costs, which is what we talked about in terms of generating, and the avoiding of depression, and accessing specialized equipment. So, but most importantly, it's a leverage that you could use because you have an asset. If you go to your bank and ask for money, they ask, What's it, what can you offer? Do you have a house? You can put some of your house against uh, the loan and what have you, whether it's secured or unsecured um, secured loan. But we are talking about either freehold, leasing, renting, or sharing. And sharing, collaborative working consortium, is an area that's underdeveloped. And um, that's my house um, back home. And um, I've moved from there. Um, since the 1968, but it's still standing in 19, um, 2024 when I went to visit it over Christmas. So just to show you that sometimes things don't change. But we could make a change. Is the organizational structure and leadership appropriate? The criteria and risk assessment associated with determining where to apply and for what purpose led us to this question of preparatory preparation and readiness typology. And the principle, and I'm just going to end here, because this afternoon we're going, to, we're going to say a little bit more, is thinking through, and the more I was reading, the more I was attending sessions, and the more I was engaging around what is an investment strategy. But the question I was asking in those forums is, what does an investor look for? What is it you need to prove to an investor a local authority grant hate maker or a national um, lottery or a donor. What is it they want from you? What hoops do you have to jump over? What is it they will use to help them make a decision? Part of that 
putting my commissioning hat on for of many years, is looking at the organizational structure, their development, where they are. Are they fit for purpose? And then the next question is, what's the risk associated with that organization or whatever stage they're at? And if you are in the lower end, level one sort of phase, the chances of an investor investing in you is going to be low because you don't have what it takes to hold their money. It means you're a high risk. If you're a high risk, low return, there's a chance that an investor is not going to be interested. However you frame that. We're not talking about pounds, shilling and pence, old money type of outcome. It's also about social outcome, social output, social value. Grant aid is around social value. So what is it? If you are highly developed, you are likely to pose a lower risk to that investor because you are highly developed and therefore you are more likely to begin to see some opportunities. So that led me to think through four levels of development of an organization allied to this principle and allied to the typology. And so the four levels, these are organizations that are in their infancy, under 25K, their developing phase is organizations that have been established for many years within more than 25K, but under 100K. And level three organizations are those that are well established and are generating somewhere between 100 and 500K per annum, and you have a strong governance and leadership. And four organizations have been established for decades and are able to attract and demonstrate income of more than half a million per annum with exceptional governance and leadership. And it's important because the definition of exception could also be value judgment and value laden. But you've got to demonstrate it through other means. But this typology begins to help us to understand organization and therefore enable us to put in place some form of support and development um, program. I'm going to pause there because the next phase is to introduce part of that approach through the Agbero 2100 program, where we begin to take this organizational development output from your voices so it's not an academic exercise that sits on someone's shelf and say, I have published this in the journal of, I don't know, um, voluntary and community sector or um, or, or the University of North Anglia, or whatever the case happened to be. Which is where, if you're not associated, you're never going to see your voices being reinterpreted or your voices giving vent to the support you're asking us for and giving vent to the support you're asking for by giving us your voices. So this is where it starts. It doesn't end. And I'm going to pass over to Michael and Phil. I'm not sure which way round to say a little bit about Agbero 2100 because this afternoon we're going to cover this and we'll extend the conversation about how this will help you to move forward. Thank you. Thank you.